When the Snow Elves entered Sarthal in the night and began their slaughter of men, likely for their discovery of the Eye of Magnus, it was said that only Isgrimor and his two sons survived. They fled the city, in fact they left Skyrim entirely, just making it out alive. Isgrimor ventured back to his homeland of Atmora, and there he gathered 500 powerful warriors, Atmorans who would sail back to Tamriel to seek vengeance on the elves who wronged them. Ultimately, these warriors would force the Snow Elves' spirits to the sky, in death, or deep underground as they sought refuge with the Dwemer, eventually being twisted into the corrupted Falmer we see today. Regardless of what you think of Isgrimor's actions, there's no doubt they have earned him a highly esteemed place in Nordic culture, with his stories still told to this day, and many settlements and structures his people built still standing. Isgrimor has since departed from Tamriel, buried far north in the Winterhold region, but his legacy lives on, and in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim you get to take part in it, or at least in what it's become. Maybe Isgrimor would be rolling in his grave if he knew of what had been made from the history of his group. Today we're going to be looking at the player's experience with the companions directly and discussing what I believe to be the problem or problems with the guild. What's going on ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael and welcome to Fudge Muppet. Today we're taking a trip to what I'd say is Skyrim's most iconic city, Whiterun, and signing up with one of the most prestigious factions in the game. If you're like me, you probably joined the companions in your first playthrough as a warrior because it's the only warrior guild you can join. You kind of have to join it as a warrior class build if you're looking for a fighter's guild type experience, although sadly in my later playthroughs of Skyrim, I'll often give it a miss for the reasons I'll be covering in this video. Instead I choose to focus on being a warrior hero by doing Dragonborn related stuff, the main storyline, the Dragonborn DLC, and even joining the Dawnguard and exterminating the vampires. It can all feel very warrior-like, but the companions, as I'll explain, don't really seem to stand for much, nor have a compelling, well-devised main plot that makes it inspiring to be part of their faction. So your first encounter with the guild was probably outside of the city, when you find some of them slaying a giant together. If you help them, you'll be praised and directed to join the companions. If you don't help them, or more likely they just kill the giant before you can even get there, you'll be ridiculed, but then suggested to head to the guild hall anyway. I can't tell you how many times I've had to pull out a bow and fire long shots from afar just to avoid being told off by Ayla. It doesn't really make sense that you're asked to join regardless of what happens, but also so it doesn't make sense to be told off for not helping. They're meant to be the grand and mighty companions, some of the best warriors in all of Skyrim, tasked with jobs that pay well and help Skyrim's people, such as defending people from the threat of a giant. Who are they to criticize a passerby? Is it not their contract that they're being paid for, and them who have trained for years on end to deal with such matters? You might be a simple farmer, a traveling merchant, or an old lady on her way to buy some alchemical ingredients. It's not not really your problem. Imagine a group of muscular, beefed up bouncers outside a nightclub having a go at someone walking down the street for not helping them to handle a drunken brawl with someone twice their size. It just doesn't make sense. But putting the small stuff aside, let's go to the guild and see what they're all about. So walking into the guild hall, you'll see some of the lower ranking members having a brawl, with everyone gathered around cheering. The fighter vibes are hearty and it feels like the perfect place for a warrior to be. Your Vasker itself this honored and ancient mead hall looks sensational, built from the ship that brought Isgrimor and many of the original companions to Skyrim. The Skyforge outside is also brilliant, and as you probably know, has some really cool lore behind it. Anyways, you want to sign up for this cool guild, so you go to the harbinger of the companions, Codlack Whitemane, and ask to join. For whatever reason, he sizes you up as worthy. But Vilkus, a master trainer in two handed and a high ranking member, strongly disagrees. Regardless of what what you say about your combat skills, you're directed to fight with Vilkus outside in the yard so he can see what you can do. He'll refer to you as a whelp, which seems to either be their lowest rank, just an insulting term for a rookie, or a mix of both. It's hard to tell as there's no strong ranking system or sense of where you stand in the guild, which is a problem with many of Skyrim's guilds. Now you may think, 
Well, they explicitly say in the companions that no one answers to anyone and so forth, but clearly while that may be the case on paper, that's not really the reality. I do like the idea that Kodlak advises but never commands, but he still sits at the head of the guild and I can't imagine you getting far with the faction if you just constantly disagreed with him and didn't help him. And then there's the circle, the higher ups who don't force you to do jobs, but you'll have to do what they say if you want to progress in the story. Vilkus does actually say to you, you do what we tell you. Clearly there is a hierarchy and if you don't do the tasks those above you give to you, you're not going to get very far. So after you strike Vilkus a few times in the yard, he asks you to take his sword to Yorlan Greymane, the blacksmith, who then gives you a shield to take to Ayla or Ayla, however it's pronounced, it's said differently by different members of the faction. You talk a little with Ayla and Skjord before they call Farkas to show you to your quarters. He tells you that you can just find a bed and fall in it whenever you're tired, and it's mentioned by Ayla that this is where the rest of the world sleep. According to Farkas, they're eager to meet you. Well, it turns out most of them look down on you and can't believe that you've even been allowed in, regardless of your accomplishments or abilities. So one of the problems here with the guild is that there's no solid recognition of who you are. You could be the most powerful dragonborn ever, slayer of Alduin, maxed out all your skills, come walking in garbed in enchanted Daedric armor with a flaming dragon bone sword, and you'll still be looked at and treated like a noob even if you one-shot Vilkus in your training session. This lack of immersion could all have been fixed with just two or three extra dialogue lines about how you're actually strong but still need to prove your dedication to the guild. It wouldn't be that hard to just add it in and make a thoughtful role-playing walkaround for high-level players. So okay, you're a whelp and the other whelps can't believe you've been let in regardless of your power level, but then out of nowhere you begin your ascent to the top of the guild with blinding speed. You have to do just one radiant quest which they force you to do constantly between missions throughout the main plot and then you're already tasked with going after a fragment of Wuthrad. A scholar tipped the guild off on a potential location holding a fragment of this ancient and powerful battle axe once wielded by Isgrimor himself and they want you to go get it as a trial. Considering that many of the radiant quests aren't too ambitious, it's quite odd to send you, who is apparently a mere whelp, on this mission so soon. Maybe you just went and killed a wolf or a frostbite spider that entered a citizen's house. Honest work but not exactly important. Impressive. All of a sudden, they're sending you deep into a Draga-filled ruin to get a piece of Wuthrad. In fact, for some reason, they've really decided you're the person for the job, and Skjord wants to speak with you about it immediately before you go do anything else. They send Farkas with you and he'll fight alongside you, but the point of him going is more to watch you perform and make sure you don't die. Personally, even if a fragment isn't 100% confirmed, I'd still be sending at least two members of the circle out for an item that is supposedly of great significance to the companions. Anyway, on the topic of Radiant Quests, most of them are honourable enough, but they're not very interesting. Having Radiant Quests isn't something I'm a huge fan of because it seems to be a crutch for Bethesda to make it feel like the player is part of the entire main purpose of the guild without doing anything that meaningful related to it. Because as you'll see in today's video, the whole main plot is a bit hazy and seems to just focus inwards on private affairs as opposed to focusing on the guild itself, perhaps the possible directions it could go in, or what it means to be a companion and live their way of life. You could argue that being a companion literally involves helping anyone else in the guild with the troubles they're facing, and therefore that's what you're doing, but having the whole focus be on dealing with the Silver Hand, who aren't really explored in depth, and the werewolf curse or blessing just doesn't seem to be on brand for a guild based on Isgrimor and his followers. I mean, the climax of the story is you fighting ghosts and curing an old man's spirit of its werewolf ties. That's hardly epic for a Warriors Guild final mission. After more and more thought, the Companion's experience is a little bit like how you join the College of Winterhold to be a mage and end up being an errand runner and a dungeon crawler instead of feeling like a student of magic. While in the Companions you join to be a fighter or a mercenary or an esteemed warrior, that theme of character, but end up being forced into being a werewolf, defending the guild from a faction of werewolf hunters who, as I'll explain, are likely justified in their action, and then helping the old guy who ran the joint to remove his werewolf curse so he can go 
go to Sovngarde. If you were to explain his Grimoire and the original companions to me before I played Skyrim and then said that there's a guild based around it, this isn't really what I'd expect it or want it to be. I'm not saying the Fighters Guild in Oblivion had the best plot of all time by any means, but at least it felt directed. You represented the Fighters Guild in tasks performed for various clients within their main plot. You constantly did Fighters Guild jobs related to their main function in society, learning of new problems, helping to address them, and having adventures along the way that weren't just radiant quests. As you did this, you climbed the ranks gradually, taking on increasingly important tasks, and eventually dealt with a competing mercenary gang going undercover in their ranks, meeting and interacting with characters, and ultimately putting an end to them and their corrupt ways. There was even that really hard-hitting quest with the Hist Sap, where you unknowingly slaughter a village that you perceive to be goblins. There were some intense moments, and the Blackwood Company was definitely a more memorable group than the Silver Hand. With the companions, you just end up forced into their werewolf club without the ability to say no, and then solve their internal politics that have devolved so far from from what the companions originally were, with some basic radiant quests on the side to help make it feel like you're still some kind of warrior for hire. Maybe you rescue someone who has been kidnapped as one of the radiant quests, but get this, other times you act as non-question asking hired muscle. Sounds like the Thieves Guild's early mission to me. You can full on be sent to go beat someone up like a paid thug, with Farkas saying he doesn't even know what it's about, but that's not the companion's business anyway. Your job is just to look tough, beat up this person and scare them into submission. It seems like they really just do what they're paid to. It's implied that the target has been giving someone trouble, but if you don't know the full story, or if their actions are justified, how can you choose to get involved and feel moral or honourable about it? The companions like to go on about living a life of honour, but this doesn't sound too honourable to me. Imagine if you're a peaceful Nord living in Skyrim's mountains, and some rich merchant wants you to sell him your land for cheap and vacate your home so he can build a gold mine there. You say no, and so he sends the companions to beat you up, saying that you're causing him trouble. The companions fixate on neutrality, but just doing what you're paid to do can be far from moral. I find it ironic that the companions won't kill for money, because that's some assassin type evil work, but they'll beat someone into submission, within an inch of their life if that's what it takes, with their fists with no questions asked, regardless of the complications that in itself could cause. But then again, the companions don't necessarily claim to be chivalrous. In fact, if you ask all of them why they joined, some of them just tell you that they like to fight and kill things, and it's an enjoyable life for them, while others just like collecting coin, drinking mead, and the feeling of being part of this family. It's a lifestyle, and being a companion means something different to all of them. So really, as you explore the main story more, especially finding out that the Circle are werewolves and tend to enjoy this curse or gift as they see it, it seems the companions are quite the jumble and don't really stand for that much. They're kind of just going with the flow, which is what it feels like you're doing too as you play through their plot. There are no overarching ideals guiding their ranks, just a vague idea of honour. There's no group goal that they all strive towards. I I mean, they're not even upholding the same ideals Isgrimor would have had, despite desperately seeking out his battle axe. Isgrimor was a highly nationalist Nord type, and regardless of whether you like him or not, the thought of there being elves among the ranks of this faction would have made him furious and upset. Can you imagine having elves enter the ranks of a traditionally anti-elf group, and then coveting this ancient relic of mass elf slaughter, Wuthrad? It just feels a bit silly. Over the course of their history, the Companions Guild has been many things. And by the time of Skyrim, it really feels like the guild is just a bunch of blood-hungry swords for hire who LARP as an ancient faction, piggybacking off the traditional motifs of their predecessors, but have actually strayed far from their original ideals. Honor to the guild members just means never backing down from a fight, not operating from the shadows, and looking out for one another. Again, that's fine, but that just sounds like the kind of default ideals that your average Nord would carry through their life. It's not uniquely companions oriented, and for me this really diminishes the point of running the guild like it's this ancient Nordic group. But worst of all, in the final mission we'll see that the highest ranking members of the companions can't even uphold this basic never back down attitude. More on that 
later. Now, if this was a Thieves Guild type situation where you could actually make a difference, maybe build the Companions Guild back to a more old school traditional group, or even double down in the other direction and take on more of the mercenary themes, embracing lycanthropy for the purpose of completing jobs, that would be really cool. Just some options to change things, but unfortunately, you're stuck with what you find when you get there and nothing really changes due to your actions. Besides the lack of choice, there's not even a linear path of development or change for the guild, and even if there wasn't going to be any change in the guild, could we at least have the focus be on what the guild is meant to be about? By the time of Skyrim, who the companions are just feels so ambiguous and unclear. Their plot feels like this too, with you getting very little insight into the main antagonist, the Silver Hand. So after you finish just one Radiant quest and go to get the Wuthrad Fragment with Farkas, you're trapped behind a gate and see him turn into a werewolf and slay some Silver Hand ambushes. They could have looked super unique, but instead they were made to just look like generic bandits. Hardly any effort was put into them. This scene was also the first of Skyrim footage I ever saw when someone leaked it onto YouTube before Skyrim's release with a misleading title like Laying Carpets 4 or something like that. So anyway, Farkas kills them, you find out he's a werewolf, and do a dungeon dive through Draga, getting the fragment and taking it back to your Vaskar. You're then told to go out to the yard where there's a kind of initiation ceremony, which is nice but I don't fully understand it in the context of where you stand in the guild. So it seems like this is a formal welcome to the Companions Guild, but if so, then what is a whelp, and why did Ayla call all the other lower ranking members whelps when she said that this is where the whelps sleep? Are you now, as an official member, above a whelp? Are all those other members still whelps? Have they ever been officially welcomed like this after all this time? Or did they also get a welcome ceremony and are more like official whelps as opposed to unofficial ones? Were you not even a fully fledged whelp before? It sounds silly to ask these questions, and doesn't matter too much in the grand scheme of things, but I just thought I'd point it out because it's another example of lack of clarity in regards to where you stand in the faction. And all those other companion members who couldn't believe you'd been let into the companions still treat you the same. Nothing changes, a lot of them are still rude, they call you the new recruit, life goes on. Anyways, you're tasked with one more Radiant quest, such as killing a wolf again, and then already it's big business time. All you've done is one quest and two Radiant jobs, and Skjord wants to meet you at the Underforge at night for some secret activity. You go into the cavern under the Skyforge and discover that Ayla is a werewolf too. This is obviously a really cool moment in your first playthrough, but it's definitely rushed. You're now being offered to join the circle. Seriously? Unfortunately for all the Ayla lovers out there, the Circle is not an exclusive dating app, but rather the most trusted and respected group of the Companions. They act as leaders and shining examples to other members of the guild. That's right, after just one main quest, one, you ascend from Whelp to some kind of official member to a fully fledged member of the Circle, complete with werewolf blood. Skior cuts Ayla in her werewolf form so that her blood leaks into a basin for you to consume. Besides the fact that this faction progression is just awful, and one of the main problems with the Companion's plot, it also ends up delivering a huge blow to your roleplaying experience. Regardless of your roleplaying, even if you're playing the most devout Nord build who wishes nothing greater than to go to Sovngarde, you are now forced to involve her scene in having some kind of claim over your soul. It's not the kind of thing that many character builds necessarily would want to agree to, and to have it forced so early into the only joinable warrior guild in the game is just wrong. You can say no, but then you just can't continue on to play the entire faction's story. As Skjord puts it, to reach the heights of the Companions, you must join in the shared blood of the Wolf. To join the Circle, your blood must be ours. He asks you, are you prepared to join your spirit with the Beast World friend? By the way, after becoming part of this circle, the other low-ranking members still don't change their attitude to you, many still treating you in a condescending way, and the Dark Elf even demanding you show him some respect. This is even up until the point you're ready to embark on the final quest in the whole plot. So you do the ritual and instantly become a werewolf. You're forced to flee the city as you're being attacked by everyone in it. Quite irresponsible of these honorable companions, don't you think? They know that these transformations can be difficult, and after you eventually black out, you wake up in the forest and Ayla tells you your transformation was even tougher than Farkas's. In the lore, we know that werewolves have a bloodlust that is hard to resist. We heard about it in the story of Sinding the werewolf, 
sadly killing a little girl, so why they would create a situation that could lead to the slaughter of Whiterun is beyond me. It also kind of lets the secret out of the bag, right? Like it's not exactly low key. Even if the Silver Hand don't have a history with the guild, which is a theory we'll be discussing today, it wouldn't be hard for some werewolf trackers to trace the origins back to the area around your Vasca with the help of witness reports. Anyways, you're with Ayla near Gallows Rock, a fort filled with Silver Hand and a Silver Hand leader, Krev the Skinner. Ayla tells you Score is scouting ahead and that it's time for a celebration. To celebrate, you're going to mercilessly slaughter all the Silver Hand there, and according to Ayla, they always make such easy prey, said like a true killer, which fits her character well, but it's a bit unsettling if you're not the kind of warrior who signed up to slaughter werewolf hunters in the night. Really, your character might actually perceive werewolves as a genuine threat to society. She also tells you not to transform publicly, saying, some cowards in this land can't stand the sight of glory before them, which to be honest is just straight up narcissistic. Why should someone just casually accept that the person next to them turned into a blood crazed werewolf while they were buying fruits. But anyways, you head through the fort killing members of the Silver Hand until you find Skior dead on the floor near the Silver Hand leader. Ayla is not pleased at all, but what did he expect going in all on his own? Krev the Skinner is the most unique character you ever meet from this Silver Hand faction, the only one with a specific name, but unfortunately this makes it all the more disappointing as you don't actually meet him or her. You don't get a story, you don't even get a conversation, Krev is just a generic Eric Bandit that you fight and is randomly generated, being able to appear as any race and be male or female. Talk about a lack of characterization. Ayla implies Krev is dangerous, but that's it. For whatever reason, she also looks down at Skior's body and says, I'm gonna find whoever did this. Krev and the Silver Hand members did it. Isn't it obvious? Ayla says you and her have work to do, and can then give you radiant quests to go kill unnamed generic Silverhand leaders, steal generic Silverhand plans, and recover more pieces of Wuthrad. They're basically meaningless radiant quests in locations randomly picked from a list with no unique characters at all. But who are the Silverhand? Do they really deserve to be slaughtered, or are they in fact the ones being honourable and true to what the companions should stand for? Well, to be honest, we don't know for sure, and as I've highlighted, this is a problem with the plot. We shouldn't have to make theories about who the antagonists actually are, as fun as that is. Imagine fighting the Stormcloaks while siding with the Imperials and not even knowing what the enemy really stands for. All you get told is they wear blue, they oppose the Empire's ways, and that's it. It would no doubt feel super underdeveloped. So the Silver Hand, they are often viewed as evil bandits with silver swords who just hunt werewolves for the heck of it. Names like Krev the Skinner are pretty evil and the torture instruments you can find show that they use some painful methods upon the werewolves they capture. But let's not get carried away here. Torture is commonplace in the Elder Scrolls universe, this isn't the 21st century. If torture devices make a faction evil, then the Dawnguard are evil, the Empire is evil, and pretty much every main faction with an army is evil. And you may say, okay, but some werewolves are peaceful. But consider this, some vampires are peaceful too, but you wouldn't think of the Dawn Guard, vampire hunters as armoured evil baddies with crossbows, would you? Groups like the Vigilance of Stendar aren't evil, but would definitely slay werewolves as well as Daedra and undead. Werewolves are unquestionably dangerous. Every werebeast you find in the wild is hostile towards you, and they have a reputation for being creatures with this bloodthirsty curse for a reason. As I mentioned earlier, Sinding is regretful of his werewolf status as it caused him to lose control and kill a girl. He didn't intend to, but only only actions matter here. Even the Circle revere the beast blood power for its capacity to inflict violence and damage, and when you first become a werewolf you can go on a bounty free killing spree of Whiterun and Ayla doesn't criticise you at all. As for a theory, I think that when Turfig, the harbinger of the companions a few hundred years before the time of Skyrim, accepted the werewolf curse and made a dodgy deal with the Glenmora witches, the Silverhand could have been a result of a group that splintered off from the faction. They could have been companions 
Europeans who thought it was dishonorable and unthinkable, desiring to one day go to Sovngarde and or not have a Daedric prince involved with a group representing Isgrimor's followers. I suggest you check out the video linked below which Scott made titled The Hidden Truth About the Silver Hand if you're interested in more insight than I have time to deliver in this video, but I'll give you a condensed version right now. So the companions have been around for nearly 5,000 years. A few hundred years ago, their leader made a bargain with witches to hunt in the name of Hercene and be granted great power. He didn't realize it would doom their spirits to Hercene's hunting grounds. From reading Kodlak's journal, you can get the impression that all the harbingers from then onwards willingly entered Hercene's realm and accepted the curse, and only the original one who made the pact regretted it. Kodlak, the current harbinger, also wishes to rid himself of what he sees as a curse, but the Silverhand members don't know this and would see him as just another companion willingly accepting the beast blood. So you can imagine at the time this happened that many people in the companions wouldn't have liked the idea of having werewolves among their ranks, especially as their leader, and therefore could have decided to split, creating a splinter faction. A divide between the warrior group could also have happened later on, as more leaders showed a willing acceptance, fully knowing what they were getting themselves into. This theoretical splinter faction would go on to become the silver hand we know today. Maybe they acted as mercenaries for hire and descended into a more bandit-like group over time, or maybe they devoted themselves to creating a group that truly honored Isgrimor and killed these heretic werewolf types. We can't be fully certain, but what we do know is that the Silver Hand seemed to have a strong love, seemingly an obsession with Isgrimor. They are desperately seeking out and providing lots of resources towards getting fragments of Isgrimor's axe, Wuthrad, and it's definitely not just so that they can ambush the companion's werewolf members. If they really wanted to make a trap to kill a companion, they could have just paid off the scholar to give false info directing them wherever they wanted. But instead, as Farkas says, when you go to find the first fragment, someone has been digging here, and they're trying to get the same fragment that you are. They would likely just know the companions would find out the same info and have prepared to attack them in advance. It's interesting that throughout the plot, the Silver Hand have gone to so much trouble to get pieces of Wuthrad, and really they could have directed all of this effort to just hunting werewolves instead. After you slaughter the Silver Hand at Gallows Rock and do two more Silver Hand related radiant quests, Kodlak catches wind of what you've done and asks to talk. Interestingly, he shows no aggression towards the Silver Hand. He says, Your hearts are full of grief, and my own weeps at the loss of Skior. But his death was avenged long ago. You have taken more lives than honor demanded. The cycle of retaliation may continue for some time. Perhaps part of the reason he doesn't want to wipe out the Silver Hand is because he understands their point of view and kind of agrees with it. Regardless of his true feelings, he asks you to go kill the Glenmoral Witches and to take one of their heads to be used as part of a method of curing his lycanthropy curse. You can take extra heads if you wish to cure other companions later, or your own werewolf form, but again, you shouldn't have had the beast blood forced on you to do the plot in the first place. Upon your return, you find that he has been killed by Silver Hand attackers who stormed your Vasca and and instead of trying to slaughter other companions members, seem to have quickly taken off with the fragments of Wuthrad they stole. The Silverhand's liking of Isgrimor also seems to go beyond collecting the fragments of his axe. When you loot the bodies of Silverhand members, sometimes they will have a book in their possession. Approximately three out of four times, the book they possess is one of the songs of the return. This is a book series which explores the time of Isgrimor, telling of his deeds and the great events which took place involving the 500 companions. There's approximately a one in four chance of there being a book on lycanthropy. That's three times as much focus on the legendary feats of conquest and history of Isgrimor and the Companions than on werewolves. This, combined with almost every interaction you have with them involving Isgrimor's axe, makes me think the Silver Hand revere him just like the Companions do. Now you might be thinking that Isgrimor is important to all Nords and is a popular person, hence the prevalence of the books, but consider this. The Silver Hand includes other races like the Khajiit, Orcs, Dunmer, and so on, and they can all be found with these books of Isgrimor. Without some kind of cultural connection to one another, there's no reason these races would be so interested in Isgrimor, particularly so because his stories have nothing to do with werewolves or hunting them. Overall, this makes me think the faction was originally connected to the companions, and really, you only look at them as evil because they're positioned that way. If you got told at the start of Skyrim that there's a group out there who hunt werewolves, your brain wouldn't jump to, oh, they're bad guys, would it? Anyways, the fact that we have to theorize 
the depths of who they are is a problem with the plot in of itself, but it's even worse that they might even be pretty justified, and you're forced into taking the other side. Being able to join the Silver Hand would have been sensational. They could have been so many cool Silver Hand characters to meet and hear the other side of the story from. Instead, they're just presented as these meanie werewolf hunters. There's no key figure to fight against or meet. There's just no strong, compelling enemy for the story. So after Kodlak dies, Vilkus wants revenge. You go to Driftshade Refuge and slaughter your way through more Silverhand members and recover the fragments of Wuthrad. There's an optional objective to wipe them all out, but it doesn't seem to change the fact that you can hunt them through Radiant Quests Ayla gives you. So the Silverhand isn't even exterminated by the end of the storyline. After this vengeance, you attend Kodlak's funeral at the Skyforge, which is nice, although if the plot was more fleshed out, perhaps you'd have more time to grow attached to him outside of just a few interactions. Yorland asks you for the fragments and asks for Kodlak's secret fragment which you retrieve from his chambers. You then go to the Underforge with the remaining members of the circle, where it is discussed that Hercene has Kodlak's soul. Vilkus talks about the legend of being able to cure Kodlak's spirit after death, but they'd need Wuthrad to get into Isgrimor's tomb. Then Yorland walks in with Wuthrad rebuilt and intact, which you'll use to gain access to the tomb and ultimately free Kodlak's soul. The members of the circle head off to Isgrimor's tomb Tomb, and you go with them taking the axe with you. Here you use Isgrimor's axe to open the way forward, but suddenly the most powerful members of the companions lose their nerve. What little they stand for evaporates. Vilkus warns of the dangers ahead and says his mind is clouded by revenge and therefore decides to stay back at the statue. Bit of a cope if you ask me. You fight through ghosts of the original companions until Farkas sees spider webs, says he's become scared of spiders now, and decides to head back to the statue as well. So much for the companions being all about never backing down. You head further and further through with Ayla, killing spiders, killing ghosts, which let's face it are quite boring enemy types for the climactic mission of this faction. After getting to the final room, you find the ghost of Kodlak warming his hands over a fire. He asks if you have the witch heads to help with a cure, and asks you to to throw one into the fire. You do, Kodlak's wolf spirit is released, and you kill it, curing him of his curse. He thanks you, decides you're the next harbinger of the companions, and heads off to Sovngarde. Ayla recognizes your new rank, and Farkas and Vilkas learn of what happened too. You can throw another head in the fire to cure yourself, and later, after more time to reflect, Vilkas and Farkas can also ask to be cured, which you can do. If you remain a werewolf, Ayla can give you totems of her scene quests, which let you go find three totems in Radiant locations which can change up your werewolf how powers. That's pretty much everything. Oh and get this, after you become the Harbinger, the other members of the Companions who were often rude still hardly recognize your rank. The effect is more like a disposition change with them saying, hello friend, instead of something less welcoming. You can also ask them to be your follower. Now I'm not going to pretend like I didn't have fun the first time I played through the companion storyline. I definitely did. But upon reflection, I think it's largely because of the gimmick of the werewolf form. It's super fun to play as a werewolf, so you're going to have a good time. But if you step back and look at how the whole plot was laid out from a role-playing perspective, there's a huge lack of choice in the direction things can go. You're forced to be a werewolf regardless of your character's role-playing, the antagonist is super underdeveloped, the whole story revolves around some internal squabbles of a faction that has fallen far from their original values, but unlike a situation like the Thieves Guild where you can build the faction back to prominence and actually change something, nothing really changes. Sure, Kodlak's curse is broken, but the Silver Hand are still around. You may or may not be a werewolf still, Ayla definitely is, and the only mercenary work you got to do was basic jobs in the Radiant Quests. Here's a hot take, I think if you took out the ability to actually become a werewolf and replaced Ayla with someone people find less easy to fall in love with and get a crush on, I think the entire experience would just rank way lower for fans, at least in my opinion. And you may say, well heaps of storylines have a fun gimmick, but really you could take out things like the Nightingale armor, for example, from the Thieves Guild, or the Vampire Lord form from the Dawnguard DLC. And the storylines may not be as cool, but they would definitely still be solid. The cool X extra novelty stuff shouldn't carry most of the whole thing. In the same way you could say dragon shouts are really cool and really fun, but looking at previous Elder Scrolls games, we don't actually need them for the main story to be good, do we? 
And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings me to the end of this video. Ultimately, the Companions Guild needed more choice, less being forced into things, more recognition of who you are and steady rank progression, a story that actually revolves around the main function of the Guild as the Companions, and better justified characters so you can really stand by them and support them against the antagonist, who should have been better developed, even joinable. Thank you so much for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you come check out our social media accounts if you're interested, or buy some of our our merch if you desire to support the content we make. My name's Michael, like this video if you still love Ayla no matter what, and I look forward to nerding out with you again very soon.